a man who needs no introduction. It's, it's Ed Myrie, VP of Business Development for Ontario. He works with uh, brokers in um, all aspects with the Viva, contracts, marketing, training, relationship management, anything you need to ask Ed, you've got it. Uh, there are some boundaries we're not talking about them, right? We'll talk about them in the cocktail bar. Next is Mary Redpath, Project Manager at North Waterloo Farmers. And in terms of uh, Mary's role, she manages corporate projects. So that sounds like a whole lot of projects. And uh, further down is uh, Kathy Curran, National Director, Broker Solutions, Sales and Distribution. How's that for a title? At Economical. So uh, Kathy is responsible for driving effective and efficient technology and workflow interactions between all of the economical companies and broker partners, as well as enhancing broker capabilities. So that sounds like a full-time job, too. And Brian Bedford, way down there. I can't see you, Brian. Hello. Uh, Manager of Strategic Projects and Privacy Officer at uh, Peel Mutual. And he's responsible for the management of selected priority company projects across all departments. It's a um, broad um, scope of projects covering claims, underwriting, IT accounting and other strategic initiatives. So, busy people. So, open forum, you can ask whatever questions you want. We do, of course, have some prepared questions in case the audience decides to be quiet and shy, which would surprise me considering the breakouts that I have been in so far today. So, any questions to start with, or do you want me to start asking? I have a question. Yes, Scott. Uh, so, over the last few years, we've gone through easy docs, Development implementation. We've got um, real time. We've got real time payments. We've got all of this stuff. All this technology. We've got companies there. What you've heard today, right? And is it possible? I'll ask, just to make it simple. Can each of you come up with one item that would be easy to, for brokers to do that would be beneficial for brokers, beneficial for companies to implement this year? I have a qualified question. Does it already exist and you're just not utilizing it? Or does it have to be new? Yeah, no, it already exists. Uh, it may, may already exist. Uh, you know, it's just, it's not being, not being used. Would it help you how, and, and vice versa? Like, great question. Mm -hmm. okay. I have one. Go ahead. Go ahead. This, uh, this is just something I recently uh, conducted a bit of a study because I was quite surprised when I heard about the number of paper copies that were still being generated. So just to give you an idea of the 174 uh, brokers that we have um, with eDocs turned on, we ran a report and it turned out that 98 of those are still receiving paper copies. Oh my God. And I'm going, what the heck's going on here? How come these guys are still getting paper copies? So we're going to be conducting, and if you are a North Waterloo broker, you'll probably, and you still have paper turned on, you're going to get a call probably from your underwriter. And we're going to just suggest, certainly we want to accommodate our brokers however we can and whatever works best for them. But just to ask the question, are you sure you really need this paper turned on? It certainly uh, would be a savings on our side, but also I can see savings on your side too because people are shuffling that paper. Question. Would any of the curious want to answer that before? But Deanna, are you going to build on that? Or well, I'd like to. Build on it? Cool. Build us a house. One of the comments that was made, and it was from, not from, I'm sorry, Catherine, economic, oh, the RSA representative. Jonathan. About the amount of upload that's not being done. Again, why don't companies push this on their brokers? If you've created the technology and it's there, why not push it on the companies? Say, we're going to turn off the paper. The, the paper's yeah. off in a lot of cases. I know, ours is. Our paper's in a lot off. Of cases. So it, but if they've got 98 of 100, how many, sorry? 74. 174 and 98 are still getting paper, yeah. why isn't it shut off? Why economical with the upload of, or the real time ability to do change, new business and such? If you created it, put the push on to brokers to take on that technology into their offices. Yeah, you know, that's a that's a really good question. Let me talk about the print suppression aspect first, because we actually did take that stance 
we, uh, we introduced uh, two methods of a push and a pull method. Uh, one in our, our broker extranet, where brokers who don't wish to receive the EDOCs could still come get them. Uh, then when we introduced EDOCs, that was our mandate. We gave a certain amount of notice, and then we did turn all of the print off with commercial lines. Uh, commercial lines is a, a little bit of a, a farther step down the road, but we will move to that same spot because we have that available for that as well. With respect to the, the upload, I would love to go up and do that. We, we are looking at training uh, more brokers on uh, our straight through processing platform. Uh, interestingly enough, we have brokers that adopt it in uh, you know, spots within their office, I guess you could say. And then when, what we have actually heard is, well, I'm short staffed, I'm on vacation, so I'm going to push it and you do it all now for two months or two weeks while I'm on. So that's where we need the support of the broker partners to be able to say, you know, we are building this, and that's what the one project is really about, is, is how do we work together? Is it education? Is it, do you know, you, are you available or do you know what's out there? Um, what do we need to do to enhance it? What's not working? Some of the things that we also learned as we started to investigate the why behind that was there was a few things that made it hard to do. We didn't even know about them because no one took the time to give us that feedback. We actually switched those and we worked with our vendor partners and the BMSs and we got those changed and now it's much more seamless. So I agree, I think we have to work in that direction. And I think we as brokers have to encourage, sorry Brian, okay. other brokers and question our other brokers who are our peers as to why they're not using what is available. Sorry, Brian, go ahead. I was going to say, it, it comes down to that the processes aren't perfect yet. So I think it's it's a little um, difficult for an insurance company to go out to a broker and say, you must use this, knowing full well that's not a 100% solution. Um, and I don't think that's good for the relationship either, for the insurer to be trying to dictate a workflow to the broker. That's not really where we want to play. But I think going long term, some of the relationships on the brokerage insurance company level, you might start to see some companies pick and choose which brokers they want to have relationships with. And part of that decision might be based on who's using technology, who's not using technology, what technology is being offered. Uh, I, I agree. Like, I mean, when I, when I think about, uh, you know, forcing an implementation of any kind, um, we'll, we'll never be in step with each other. By nature, we can't ever be. We'll never develop the same thing at the same time because we have different system constraints. Period. So full stop. And and, and if we did force someone to adopt something, uh, as you can guess, it's went through a change management workshop, right? Um, culture change is huge. And if we just ignore uh, a broker's individual culture change that might be needed in order to adopt something, and therefore didn't accept their business. I don't even know how we would survive. So, uh, so that kind of flexibility in our business is absolutely necessary um, in order to maintain revenue. Like it's it's almost as simple as that. Now, having said that, um, out of the event, I know Economical used to be there, and I'm sure other carriers as well. We do not treat every broker equally at all, and we don't apologize for that because some brokers that really do adopt processes and really do things in amazing ways. We do lots of interesting things about that, right? And that's a simple fact, so, so we don't treat it all the same. Although sometimes it might feel like we treat everyone the same by you know, not just turning off paper or some decision like that, but it is anything but. It's, it's extremely complicated, distribution management overall. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, I, I was wondering, I was looking for you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I, I was I was somewhat shocked to hear in our uh, last breakout, not the last two breakout sections ago, that to implement eDocs you had to have four different solutions with the broker management companies. Um, it would be nice if some of the larger insurers met in a coordinated effort with the broker management companies because if there's four that's still not bad working size and if the larger companies met with them so that there can be some kind of a common interface that you only have to design to one interface 
CZO standards, work with them with, through C, CSIO or whatever, so that all of us who use those four broker management systems can get stuff easier <coughs> from you. It would be not so. Um, I mean, there are four. There's probably three or three or three of the four here now. It would be nice if, and it doesn't have to be the entire industry, because if two or three of the largest companies out there that cover 30 percent of the market share can coordinate standards to the four BMS or and have them conform to a same yes. standard. We got your question. Thanks, Chris. So you're talking about Wait, you mean the dots are particular? You didn't hear the question? Okay. Very beginning oh, part of okay. here. So Rick's question is, is there a way that the carriers could have some interface where they only had to build one pipe out to the four BMS vendors instead of building four pipes out so that we could come to market faster with different real-time uh, technologies where I believe the boy was going. So, I think that what that's yeah. what the CSIO portal tried to do and yeah. synchron and synchron and so I think the attempts have been there over the years. But that had the whole industry doing it. Mm -hmm. If you have the top two or three meeting with the four top BMS vendors, mm -hmm. everybody else could fall in line after that. Yeah, there's challenges to that. And that, and actually it's almost the same answer I gave a moment ago. Maybe that's what prompted the question. Um, we all have different system limitations, different priorities, and uh, and to try to coordinate that would be, I'm almost wondering if it would be, a, you know, semantic competition and things we might run into. Um, banks, so Banks can do it. Interact can do it. But, but that's just a kind of, that's a very simple transaction, Rick. That is taking my, putting money into your account or taking money out of your account. We are talking a very complex business here. Oh, I understand. Yeah. But, yeah, but, I, but I love the intent. And, then that, and we lean on CCO for that. Like, uh, um, I see that as, like, standards development is a really big deal. So, uh, you know, and then, of course, when we get into solution creation, it's, it is all about standards to try to minimize the differences you're talking to. Right. So, um, but you do, we do come at it from a standards perspective as opposed to a collaboration perspective. But right. you got to collaborate to get standards. And if they're all working the towards that. But CZO does have all yeah. those players at the table yeah. to develop the standards. Yeah, and even, even with EDOPS, which just sounds like was the crux of, I am over there, conversation in the last panel, which I wasn't in, um, there is differences in interpretation. There's standards. But there is also differences in interpretation between each of the DMS vendors and each of the carriers who are all following those standards. And that's what we found when it came to EDOTS was we built it out and sent the same file to each BMS vendor and then had to amend slightly to integrate and download to each one, which is fine. It worked where everyone was following the standard. The channel was the key in that thing, which is kind of kind of you know going back to what you said. The channel was the same. It was a single channel. We're all going through. Uh, it was a very standardized piece. That's eDocs. But I agree with that on the back end system. The challenge lies in the, in the variety that we all have, legacy versus web-based versus the next. But certainly, you know what? I, I, I'm going to speak for me, but I don't know if what you guys all think. We would love to build it out once. I love that. I'd love to say, you know what? Here's the only one we have to build to. That, that would be one. And by the way, you have to implement or I'm turning off. <laughs> <laughs> that, would be, like, that would be awesome. But there, there's, there's some merit to that thought, though, because we're talking basic policy data. All the other stuff that we do to differentiate ourselves in our BMSs, maybe maybe that's a whole other conversation with BMS vendors in the room. I don't know. Jeffy? So, so some of us were in the commercial seminar here. Is EDOC adoption like 79, 80% no. in the industry? And I like the fact that if people play ball, they should get some bonuses. But if other guys in operations are not using the tools, they need to get less commission because we're subsidizing their lack of using it, and they're holding the industry back for dead weight. So yeah. the sooner we say, guys, you either get with the program or what type of commission, and well, it hurts them in the pocketbook, then they'll step up. And they need well, like that fire underneath them. That's my thoughts anyway. Let's let stop one them. project, um, see what, what changes we can uh, make in our industry, Jeff, and then we'll be lobbying the carriers to lower the bill. Like EDOC's an old brainer. You can't get EDOC's working in 2015 as a broker. 
Well, but well, there are your survival chances in the long run. So it's something that we need to make sure that these guys need to get mine, or yeah. these guys should be getting uh, eight percent on a, a personal auto renewal, maybe fifteen on property, like you know whatever the whatever yeah. your cost. Well, just on that previous commercial panel, they talked about um, Polaris in the UK it has an eye market with yeah. a complete electronic, you know, solution. So something happens to make yeah. that happen. We should just look and see. Well, what happens? Rick, Rick should be able to tell us that. Well, it was already adopted by the time I got there. I mean, it started, it started out, honestly, as an industry portal. So similar to what Cesio talked about building a yeah. Cesio portal for commercial lines, they literally built a, a Cesio equivalent portal for commercial lines, mm -hmm. and the data are evolved from that. Uh, yeah, maybe we need an orbit IDA or part, or maybe that's what we're going to come up with. Yes, I think once you see companies going to Guywire Policy Center, well, Guywire is built on, on a core standards. I think you'll see more traction then, yeah. and more usability of for admin. Yeah, I agree. I actually think a lot of our problems will be deep problems because uh, there's no question significant market share, as to your point, is, is moving to Guywire as we speak, and uh, that offers completely different opportunities. Yeah. And that's what Guywire has that good layer of yeah. data about. So can we move away from the folks, right? What? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pat. No. Oh, who no. was it? Who was it? Okay. So can we move away from real time for just a minute? Is everybody okay with that? Yes. Yeah. I know we'll come back. Trust me, I know that. So um, we have uh, seven really good questions here. Yell out a number, and that's the question I'm going to ask. Three. Okay, three. So how have you guys aligned your business strategy with your digital strategy? So because, you know, they, they are two different things and, and digital seems to be jumping out at us. Um, well, I don't so think they are two different things. I think actually... They were in the past, so we just okay. had to have a business strategy before. Now we have to have, we have to align our business with our digital. Do we not? I think Maybe actually you need a business strategy. Yes. And there are digital elements of that. Right. So I, I don't think that it's just a way of communicating. It doesn't change what you should be communicating. So I think about communities. In fact, I had this conversation just a little while ago. Uh, you think of, uh, you know, what service industry are you with? Are you Lions? Jeff, are you the Lions? Kinsman. So you're in Kinsman, right? There's an example. A lot of you are probably involved in service community, things like that. Well, what digital communities are you in? It's not different. It's not the, a different thing you're doing. It's just in a different place. And uh, so I don't, myself, I don't see those as different. Okay. Mary? I'd have to agree with that. I, I see the two as being very much intertwined. Um, if you were to uh, read through our strap plan, for instance, it uses a lot of the terminology, technology as an enabler of, and then technology as an enabler of um, issues uh, or, or items on our um, strap plan that involve uh, increasing productivity, but also um, increasing or uh, decreasing our expenses. Uh, those types of things, um, and uh, and definitely the two are are intertwined. But it's adding a how, right? It's a different how. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's around the how. It's yeah. You know, I think we've heard loud and clear today about the, the customer experience that we all need to focus on, and quite frankly, the customer experience is different than it was five years ago or ten years ago. And I think what sometimes gets uh, in the way is I think people equate digital to always being like an online quote or an online, everything being done themselves. Digital is just an experience for a customer and how we've aligned that to our business strategy. We, I agree, it is, it is one with some components around how we help brokers navigate through those waters so that they can you know, continue to, to bring advocacy and advice to an ever-changing marketplace. And that may have electronic or online or search engine optimization or website design or whatever that might mean. But those are components that could simply be an acquisition tool that finish in a brick and mortar operation. Right? Yeah, nothing really new to add there. I mean, it's digital is really baked in every conversation yeah. that happens at the board level. Any project that's being discussed, there's always now a digital component. So not really a separate strategy. You'll hear us say customer preference a thousand times. Like Greg several lately has talked about customer preference on yeah. how many times. And, uh, and the reason for that is because customer, if customers prefer text, email, phone, I mean, cooperators right now, quite frankly, is doing a great job of this. Mm -hmm. They're omni 
their omni-channel experience. Um, it's about customer preference. It's not a digital strategy. Mm -hmm. Digital is one method. And, and how, or do, several, actually. how do brokers, how do you see brokers, or how do you involve brokers or uh, in that other arm, the other, the additional how? How to help them evolve? Well, how do you see them? So you've got a business strategy that includes all these digital touch points. So how do brokers fit into your business strategy with all the different touch points, I guess is the question. So one of the terms uh, that we use, our value proposition, is customer intimacy. And um, definitely uh, we involve our brokers um, at our broker council um, on bouncing off ideas off of uh, key brokers in terms of ideas that we have for technology. And we seek their feedback. We have uh, focus groups uh, of brokers that we can use when we're rolling things out in a pilot um, type program to, to seek that feedback. So certainly uh, the broker is key in any of the technology deliveries that we have. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really around helping brokers build their brand and build it, maybe um, you know, providing them access to whether it's co-op marketing or where do they even target market. So we have target mapping tools and a lot of data that we can share with brokers that say here's a profitable consumer here's what they like here's how they shop here's how they where they like to go and help share that brokers or that data with brokers so that they can then take that and help themselves and, and build a digital presence out there Sure. Um, I'd say it'd be nice to have pockets as deep as uh, some of the other companies at the table here. But, uh, <laughs> we, we unfortunately do not, but uh, being part of uh, OMEA, the Ontario Mutual uh, Group, there are some things that uh, that we can leverage there to assist brokers with um, such digital marketing campaigns and, and work around websites and SEO and, and those types of things. So those are things that we can uh, we can try to help out with if that's of interest to brokers. Um, it's not really something us as a company has an expertise in, in doing, whereas I know Ed has a part of his team <laughs> that uh, is solely focused on that or 50% of the time, is it? Like that. And, and beyond, so, yeah, and, and I guess, yeah, it, being, a, being a multinational company as well, I mean, we've, we, have a, we have two now digital garages. Right? So there's a digital garage in London, England, and, and they literally take ideas that brokers and us collaborate together to, to, to design and dream up and then we take them there and try to build solutions in 60 days. Um, that actually has now also been replicated here in Canada, so we are continuously in the same kind of thing. Like, you know, it can be through councils or presence club or, or through um, or through one-on-one -on -one interactions where we uh, are constantly trying to collaborate with brokers to find out what can be done next. More importantly than the big idea like that, though, maybe the revolutionary idea, far more important, I find, these days is I said before, like you know, uh, brokers kind of you have to start your web strategy, your digital strategy with your web page. It is the trunk of the tree of the marketing tree in the digital space. But how exactly are you connecting all the other parts to it? You know, about two years ago, social media was the big buzz, right? Everybody thought, oh my gosh, I got to get on Facebook. Uh, apparently, I can get free branding there because I just have to get engaged, and boom, it's going to magically happen. And and uh, I saw a lot of people really. Spend a lot of time and effort in that space, and to, they don't really know what measurable gain they got. And so now it's really about we're collaborating with a lot of brokers, and we're just expanding as we go along. We're literally just, you know, working through just. To, I'm sure we'll work through every broker we have in, in a short amount of time. But so, what is your plan? You know, it's, it's really about you know who are you first? Who is your customer? How are they going to remember you? And how are you going to fulfill? And like, those are kind of marketing basics, but then you have to apply your digital lens to that. Okay, so now, how are they going to find me? I mean, who, how are they going to remember me in that busy, busy space? Um, I don't know. So this digital journey, it's, uh, I see it as something that like, every single person at Aviva right now is almost obsessed with because it is how customers are interacting. It, not really fulfilled, as Brian, you know, as there was a 6% piece uh, said before, of 6% people buy online, but 70% do research there, you know, 80% do research there. 
and how does research tend to turn into a sale? That needs to be the, a, a strategy that you need to understand. <laughs> Well, yeah, I was just going to say, just uh, quickly to that, is what we, we've seen in many instances is, it, just bang on what Ed said, is, you know, they, they've spent so much investment in their website, and they, they say, you know, get a quote online, and then they call them back 12 hours later. Like, they don't have the back-end infrastructure that also must be in place to be able to support, versus uh, there was one broker we went into this week, did a quote on, on their website online, uh, ironically enough, and you used our own information, our own cell phone, uh, within about probably 60 seconds later, someone on the other happened to be on the other side of that wall in the broker's office, phone, and said, I see you just did a quote, what can I help you with? Like that's the kind of back-end infrastructure you need to have in place when you talk about being in a, a digital world. Now, there's the other extreme of that too. Forms work, right? Yeah. You don't have to have an online port. Forms work. But how are you getting back to the people, and how, what's your timing like? If it's under five minutes, you'll do okay, but even with a form, just a because if someone will give you your name and address and a telephone number, boy, that's a pretty committed person with intent on the internet. In fact, that's incredible if they put that in. And quite frankly, shame on us if we don't fulfill. So I don't know, but it really has to be thought through of exactly how you can execute on all those bits. So, uh, Marion, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for North Water and farmers in the next three years? <laughs> well, I don't know if everyone's seen the uh, press releases, um, but uh, we're in the process of uh, uh, consolidation uh, with uh, a merger with uh, Oxford Mutual. And so certainly this is something that's really prevalent in the uh, farm mutual world. Uh, that uh, that's that's going to um, you know present its own challenges um, and opportunities definitely for us. But uh, to uh, maintain the competitiveness, it, it is the reality that that's what we're seeing in the farm and mutual world. Right. Three years, greatest opportunity next three years. I think um, the biggest opportunity, and not just for us as a company, but for the broker channel, is an education of the consumer. Um, when you look at insurance in general, it's pretty much bottom of the barrel. It's in there along with uh, used car salesmen and that type of thing. Anytime there's anything that goes out on the internet, any sort of press that goes out, if you actually read the comments, if you can get past the first two or three, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, and it's all negative. So I think there's a big opportunity, and brokers being on the front line with the, with the consumer is educating them on what we actually do and what we do in a positive way um, for everyone. Rather than just always seeing the negative, my claim's not paid, my claim's not paid, my claim's not paid. Um, I think getting some education out there and raising the awareness um, is a huge opportunity. Yeah, I think we heard that from Brian this morning too. Yes. Biggest opportunity for me the next three years. Um, <coughs> well, clearly we've got an interesting announcement to play. Um, <laughs> really? Really. Um, and I actually see, like, I mean, as the, so we're, you know, just in case I was wondering, you know, Viva announced we're going direct. Um, and I think it is a massive opportunity for the broker channel. Okay. And the reason why I think that, just to keep it what's interesting, um, the reason why I think that is because I know the types of learnings we've taken from working with brokers in kind of direct dish ways in the past, such as uh, President's Choice, for example. Mm. President's Choice was uh, you know, something that competed directly with brokers a while back and was a direct play, and then it wasn't, and it became a broker play. And as a broker play with multiple markets, it's been tremendous. And I, we know exactly how marketing works there, we know exactly how we attract customers there, and we know exactly who those customers are, right? So we know where they come from, we know who the prior carriers are, and it's, it's well over 70% of that customer base comes directly from the TDs, the RBCs, the Valors of the world. So we know that that competition happens against that area. And we are very actively taking the learnings from all of those things and applying them to the broker channel as well. So I see that as a massive opportunity for brokers because there's, you know, if, if you think of it this way, we have 50% uh, you know, of the market uh, in the broker channel today 50% not in the rubber channel. We're really interested in investing in, in, the, in what's happening in this 50%, but we're not giving up this part. We want to make this part better. So 
And I see that as a massive opportunity for brokers, because I mean, here we are doing this initiative, and I'm the broker distribution guy, and I've never been more excited for the kinds of things we're working on than I've been today. Because the digital landscape and how that can transform your business will make some brokers really grow tremendously. But you gotta figure it out. You gotta really understand what that's gonna go to. And um, I don't know, I am really energized, probably more than I have been in a long time with what's happening in the digital arena. The real tangible differences we're making on a broker by broker basis and how we're helping them understand their digital strategy, understand their digital world, and where we're gonna go. And um, I don't know, when you start to see the learnings that you start to have with a broker going down this path, it is tremendous. It's energizing. It's almost like taking a whole bunch of people that didn't quite know how to be even more entrepreneurial and giving them even more entrepreneurial juice to kind of you know, drink every morning. And uh, I don't know, it's been really exciting. That's that by far, to me, on the broker side of the event, is my biggest opportunity. Okay. Okay. See the 10 minutes signed. Yeah, I, I was agreeing. <laughs> Thanks, Simone. Uh, yeah, we're, we're really excited. We're building out uh, a broker value proposition uh, that's going to have a lot of um, elements to it that will directly support the broker distribution channel in, a, in the marketplace and where it's evolving to in the next three years. Uh, so we believe that's, a, in a long, similar line, is a good opportunity for us to partner with strategic brokers and enable them uh, to compete with uh, the alternative channels that are available. I think that's for us what we're really excited about right now. And you'll start to see some of that work in the in 2015. So Kathy, back to you again. Yeah. We, we had Patrick talk this morning about the Internet of Things and safe equals lower premiums. So uh, as that evolves, so how do you see carriers, how do you see economical responding to lower premiums? Yeah, yeah, we had this, this discussion. I'm not quite convinced that that's going to materialize to the same extent that was discussed or has been discussed in the industry. Um, I believe that there are still variables. Uh, let me let me step back. There'll be pockets of, of risks and policies where certainly that will be the case, where you will have your homes monitored, you will have the utmost security on your car, you will be able to do things remotely to help control the losses, if you left the oven on, like all of these things. But we still have variables that will drive up premiums and we have things such as weather patterns. You could have quite the secure home in Airdrie, Alberta, it's not gonna help you when hail comes. It's not going to help your car that's sitting out in the road. We saw in Texas the flash flooding that happened this morning. Those were beautiful homes. Half of them were top end cars. There's things such as weather patterns that are, and other variables that are outside of the control of just the predictive analytics from an individual risk. I think it will help control pricing in risks that uh, warrant it. Uh, but weather patterns along that way. Um, behavior, the fraud claims that still persist in some of the, you know, that help drive up the, the premiums and the expense. Those are things that I'm still not quite convinced the Internet of Things will be able to lower premiums as much as we believe. And I do want to add a comment to that. Yeah, and I was just going to say too, uh, with the Internet of Things comes a tremendous cyber risk um, that we haven't even really figured out yet. But uh, all we know now is it's a hot button and a new thing. I mean, look how fast drones are changing how we think. Um, you know, because all of a sudden there's something new and it impacts aviation. Well, who's licensed for aviation up here? You know, I don't know about you guys, not me. But, um, but uh, so, I don't know, I, I, is it going to go down? I think actually also, there's going to be more different, more types of products that need to be offered. Um, so, I think revenue per customer will stay pretty stable. I think the premiums and where they come from will likely change. Mary, I gave you a magic wand. Oh. Yep, and, 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 and uh, I, I'm, I'm asking you to consider the art of possible. What are you creating? Uh, so for me, it would really be SEMSI. Um, so the single entry multi carrier um, interface. Uh, 
it just uh, makes sense to me and tied into that would be the whole idea of single sign-on. Uh, it absolutely drives me crazy when uh, we have to uh, have people storing yellow stickies with passwords and uh, this type of information all over the place or, or um, having difficulty trying to remember how do I use this portal or how do I use that portal. So that, that would be Sam's my right. magic wand. Brian, I'm giving you a blue magic wand. What are you doing? Um, well, I think just the fact that we're here is it's very similar to that. Um, single entry, um, the flow through directly from a customer through a broker to the company, seamlessly, it works, um, there's no headaches, that would be wonderful. I'm not sure we'll get there. I hope we do, we're getting part of the way there. Um, and I think that's why we're here. So I think a lot of the people in the room are on the same page on that and we want to try to work towards that. Kathy? You know, I can't say enough of that certainly the the vision on the on the first line side, I'd love to see more automation on commercial. I think that's the, that's the, the real opportunity and we need to start driving that. If we don't start driving it now, it's going to be another 15 years, just like personal lines to start catching up. So I think the commercial automation is huge. Uh, I'd like to see uh, brokers take and carriers alike and, and uh, monetize the data that they, they have and be able to use that effectively to, to do targeted marketing campaigns and drive profitable business and clients. And uh, those are kind of the three areas for me. Okay, and Ed, nice one. Mm. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing the abolition of the word traditional broker. <laughs> Who giggled over here? Because uh, that's a term that's being used a lot, and uh, and I'd love to see brokers really, you know, show what they're made of right now. Um, I think that'd be really, really fantastic. So I'd love to see that word just not even be existing. Just, just be a broker, insurance broker. Well, yeah, be an be an insurance broker. So because traditional, I don't know about you, but oh, wait, I was called traditional. I kind of like, you know, I don't know if I want to be labeled that, and um, and the reasons for the reasons for being you know that label existing are, are real. Um, because of those adoption rates you showed in that survey initially, and it kind of drives us nuts. Yeah. So if if uh, so, quite frankly, if in three years, and you've heard me talk about this umpteen times, if we could actually have real implementation of what's possible today without developing a single other thing, if in three years we had all of those uh, implemented to 80% effectiveness, that would be a dream. Three years? You would give it three years? I, I'm just dreaming. Well, I'm thinking shorter. I'm not thinking longer. Uh, yeah, you gave me the time frame. Okay. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, any last questions? Because we have two minutes. Just a quick question. So traditional means it's okay not to change. I like your attitude. Stuff. Yeah, just be glad to be here. That's great. Uh, question, uh, SEMC was mentioned twice. Uh, it's important, obviously, we went straight through processing for our staff, so we don't have to go into company portals and run them all the problems we all know well about. But more importantly, our clients, if we can't do it with our staff, our, our clients can't do it on our website right. directly. Now, Ed mentioned leapfrog. What are we going to do to solve this problem? We come here, we talk, we go rah, rah, we leave, like cheerleaders excited. But then another year goes by and stuff doesn't get done. How is this year going to be different? What are you going to do about it to make it different? You're asking the carriers? I'm asking you? everybody here, everyone's pipe up. But, you know, I, you know, I can throw that back different? and I say, what is the broker distribution channel going to do to help support it as well? So it's I don't think it's it's just on the carriers to oh, do I that. Know, the, by all means, yeah. I, as I said, how can we, can't, can't we work together to, to yeah. make this happen? Yeah, that's Remember the question game before of, you know, could all the carriers get together and figure out how we're going to do something all together? Um, I don't believe that that's very likely. I hope it would be on some things, such as an interact solution, but um, I don't think it's necessarily very likely. Do I think that all brokers are going to get together and also implement everything at the same time, at the same speed? I think there's just simply far more of them. The chances of that are even more unlikely. So what, what are we going to do about the changes? You're going to see us continuing to try to partner with every single broker, clearly, and ones that are more on the readiness scale, we're going to do more with. That doesn't mean forgetting people that are, that are wherever they are on that spectrum, 
We're going to work with them all, but we're absolutely going to work with brokers for where they are, because every broker is in a different stage of cultural change. Yeah. And and for me to assume that you can all do something, I think that'd be almost harmful. Um, but uh, but for us to work with all of you as individuals, understanding who you are, what your challenges are, having a real good meeting about where we're going to go, I think that has tremendous promise. And I think that the, the one project is going to help, and, and having brokers commit, and, and we'll work with our carrier uh, stakeholders to help um, drive up the implementation of what exists today. Jeff, we, I, IBAO and Orbit are committed to that project. I thought we'll come out with a map. You need a destination one. You need to come over with a better industry ETA for this map. That's, you know, we need to have a certain date where I realize everybody can't Well, well we're, we're going to have a meeting. Uh, again, we just got the survey, and actually somebody can complete a survey again this morning, so we're going to take another look at it in the next two weeks by, by DAO and Orbit, and we will have a very, very tight timeline plan within the next, complete within the next two months. So we will deliver that to all of you, because we're kind of serious. And going with his comment as well. Battling. Sorry, and going with Jeff's comment as well, um, I know for example for us as a brokerage, we had a um, few staff changes over let's say the last five to eight years roughly. And um, as a new person coming on to the office and having to all of a sudden look at all our different insurance companies and say, okay, what is it that Peel Mutual does again and how do you do that and get that implemented? And then, well, what does Economical do? And by the time I get to Aviva, yeah. Peel's already made some other changes and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I thought I just did that like six months ago. And I found as a broker having to try and catch up with all my companies, and I know Orbit has a list of different things that each company um, has in place or has available, but it'd be really nice, I know for our office we look at it, and we don't have the companies coming to us and saying, hey, we just want to do a review with you this year, and did you know we have blah, and give us a list, and be able to say, hey, can we do, are you knowing that we're doing all this and do you know how it functions? Because I think for, uh, I know for our office, it went so fast in the last couple of years for us that I'm having a hard time trying to keep up with what you guys all do on an individual basis and trying to make them implemented to help with those figures you were talking about this morning. Well, and the other thing that we're doing to uh, IDEO and Orbit is giving you guys the resources in one central location to know where to go and look. So you, maybe you have somebody in your office who looks at that monthly or who looks at that weekly or whatever to see, based on your BMS, what are your carriers doing with them now? So I used to be a broker, and, uh, and we had nine markets. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and, uh, and I was always amazed that on the underwriting side, we have a tough time getting underwriters to, uh, to know auto property for one carrier. Uh, it's kind of shocking. But so uh, the, the respect that I have for how difficult that challenge is is, is innate because I've done it. And it's, it's not easy. Um, but I think that there's also understanding your own BMS. Maybe start there, just as, just as, a, as a suggestion. Because there are likely a lot of things you can do in there that are company agnostic. Uh, you know, that might be able to be implemented as best, best practice processes for your shops. Um, just a suggestion, I don't know where the best place to start is. And clearly, staying in contact with things like Orbit that have a dashboard of who can do what, that's great. And, uh, you know, I think most of, a lot of companies now are developing, you know, where it's the big raw and they still call them BICs. BDS now. Yeah, business development specialist. Yeah. Right. We love our short forms. We love yeah, them. we have BDSs too. And then we have oh, accounting executives too. And, uh, you know, you copy those. But anyways, uh, <laughs> but, any, but anyways, point is, is those resources are great and they can help you a lot. And I know that uh, you guys, yeah. Yeah. You guys can call these guys directly, probably. So I mean, for, for the people that you guys deal with, you help them constantly. Um, reach out to your carriers for help. They actually have probably more resources than you think. Um, just so people don't realize it, and they think they're alone. You're not alone. Yeah, no, I just quickly to add to that, Court, absolutely reach out, because that's their dedicated role set, and that's what they're there for. So they're there, they will take out all the guesswork out of it, and they will share whatever they can. They know your broker management systems as well, so they can understand how it all works together for you. And if you're not getting that, feel free to reach out directly to us. Yeah, literally anybody here, if you don't know who your person is at Aviva, send something to me, yeah. myself, I'll direct to the right person, that's easy enough. 
and make sure the message gets um, trickled down, depending on who yeah. is visiting your office and who they're talking to. The message doesn't always make it to everyone. Yeah. Uh, and the same going back the other way. Okay, Rocky, did you have your hand up a minute ago? No, I thought somebody over there did. Okay, we're back to Mr. Dresden. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Does anybody else want to ask a question before Rick? Because he will take all of your time, I guarantee you. <laughs> no? Okay, go ahead, Rick. Um, as companies, are you reaching out to the laggards? I mean, you guys know who's using your tools. And EDOC's perfect example. It's only, what, 60% uh, implementation. Are you going out to those 40% and providing a business case or directing them to IBA or directing them to Orbit to learn the business case for them to implement? Like, I don't know what other brokers aren't using it. I know we're using it 100%. We're using all the tools available to us 100%. So, like, I can't influence anybody else other than stand up one of these and say, please implement. But you guys know who's, who's using the tools. Okay. You're the only ones who know. Want me to tackle first? Go for um, so with respect to, I mean, I mentioned before how complex this is, and, and what makes it sometimes even more complex is these days the multiples to sell your business are awfully high. Mm -hmm. So it's a fine line, right? How much do I say, hey, you must change to whatever the new thing is? And then how much might they just turn and go, you know what, this is just too much of a problem for me. Where's my multiple? Who's going to talk to me next to, to sell my business? Um, Managing distribution, in fact, I was going to know the threat question didn't come up, but yeah. distribution control is by far my number one threat. And, uh, and so with those kinds of options out there, boy, things are tricky in the distribution space right now. And I actually feel terrible for any broker with an acquisition strategy, because how do they afford that now? It's a whole other issue. So even if you have a broker that's interested in acquiring, how can they? Right? Like, this is... Uh, so to the, to the point of, we absolutely do coach. We absolutely do go in there, and like, you know, for example, we have a, a program going on right now, we're calling it Concierge Plus. But we're basically going to our, to our brokers, and we're just working through the, the broker numbers. But, you know, we actually know, we track the exact reasons why you're calling Concierge. And most of it is, how do I? Almost 50% of the calls are people saying, how do I do this? And mostly, they already know. They just want a little bit of an okay uh, to make, you know, to kind of like a you know CYA kind of thing. Um, but going back to brokers with knowledge of what their staff are actually doing and interacting with us, and, and what way can be more efficient, and uh, that is happening ad nauseum. Um, the, the payback on that is tremendous. And are the rest of you uh, letting brokers who aren't using it, are you reaching out to them? And this is truly the last question. Uh, well, getting back to my example that I gave earlier, definitely we do monitor um, and take a look at who's using the technology, who's not, and go out and try to encourage them. But it is really a balancing act because we're trying to preserve relationships and we want to um, make it as easy to do business with us in whatever uh, channel works for the broker. But certainly we will try to, um, but uh, in terms of, uh, you know, putting the hammer down and demanding that this is the way you have to do things. Uh, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, yeah, in that role we talked about earlier, we have kind of a, a two-pronged approach to that. Uh, first is uh, we have a national broker system support team, uh, which tracks all of the kind of to Ed's point of the the calls of why, how do I do this, passwords, so you can know, name it, all of that. So. Then what they do is they do uh, dashboarding and they take the trending up to this broker or business development specialist role who then um, will interact with the brokerage and the front lines, oh, whether that's uh, training that's required, whether it's education, whether it's putting them in contact with their BMS vendor, um, whatever that might be. And they do that uh, uh, for their, their broker panel throughout the year. And Brad, just last word, yes, you do? Something we're going to improve on. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Nothing else? No. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. Anything else? <laughs> Thank you to our parents.